I'm going to talk about the scapegoat because I, I have a fascination with it. And I have been digging and digging and digging. And this is what I've come up with and tried to match it up with what is actually going on. So anyway, we're going to do the, the portion is a cream boat after the death. So if you got your Bibles, you may want to open up to that. It starts in chapter 16. Now, the first verse is rather strange because it doesn't seem to go anywhere. But it begins by saying, Hashem spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons when they approached before Hashem and they died. Then he begins by saying, and then Hashem said to Moses, speak to Aaron, your brother. He shall not come to at all times to the sanctuary with the curtain in front of the cover that is upon the ark so that they should not die. For in a cloud will I appear upon the ark of ark cover. And with this shall Aaron come to the into the sanctuary with a young bull, a sin offering, and a ram. So he's talking about the Yom Kippur. Now, Nadav and Avihu died on uh, in Nisan three months earlier. So I began to question, okay, so what's this about? What is why why does he begin with this verse? And it appears as though, according to many of the rabbis, that when Nadav and Avihu actually went into the uh, uh, Holy of Holies to provide their, to put forth their incense, they actually did it absolutely correct, but it was the wrong holiday. It was not a time for them to be in there. In fact, there was only supposed to be one there and not two. But then I went back and I began to look again, and I found out that Nadav and Avihu arrived there simultaneously, not because they both came there together, but they came separate. And they arrived at the door at the same time with the same idea. Now, the idea was that they were going to uh, undo the sin of Adam, that they were going to use this. this remember, Adam sin took him out of the garden and into the need for sacrifices so these two came with the idea that they could go into the sanctuary which was the garden of eden in the holy of holies and again offer an offering and their offering as they present it is themselves there was no ram there was no bull there was nothing but themselves and at that point in time god took them but there's never a statement that says, first off, the only statement says that he, they were not correct in what they did. But it doesn't criticize them because they became honored for what they attempted to do. Which led me into understanding, okay, let me find out what Yom Kippur is about. And then as I began to look at Yom Kippur, then I found myself not frustrated, but concerned. What is the goat? a scapegoat have to do with Yom Kippur? What's it about? Well, we know that the boys went into the sanctuary with a, in one hand, the Ketorah, the, the, the incense offering. In the other hand, they had a shovel pan that was filled with the coals from the altar on the outside. And they brought both of them in there before him. And then they began to pour the incense into the ashes causing the great smoke to rise and a perfume to fill the room. And it was in the midst of that that they began, that they died, that God took their soul away from them. Now, the idea is that they took their soul by burning it from their body, but there, there's no, the body is still intact. It was completely restored. There was nothing missing except the soul itself. Now, in doing so, they found themselves in there in a very precarious position because you're only allowed to enter the, the room one time a year and only the high priest. But now we have two people there. Not exactly describing how they got them out, but we do know that there were points in time when the, all, the whole area needed to be cleaned in the temple and assumed that it needed to be cleaned there. And therefore, that's when they began to draw them out of the out of the room. Moses or Aaron, one of them had to have gone in, but probably Moses, and brought the two boys out. 
it's after that point that we begin to notice that the, the garment of the priest changes. Because around the bottom of the, of the garment, you'll find pomegranates and bells. And the understanding is that the pomegranates and bells were to be applied to the garment in order so that people outside would know that the character, the high priest, was still alive. And again, to avoid death in there, or even if someone did die, in order to bring them out, a rope was tied to their leg. And they were literally brought out of, the, out of there, if necessary, by the rope and not going in there. But that's more of that story. But I'm still struggling with the, the scapegoat. Now, in our story, then, we begin by understanding there's smoke and ashes. And the smoke and ashes provide what appears to be a highly spiritual, emotional place as what's going. Anyway, as we go in there, I had to find out that there was a thing called the smoke. And the word for smoke in Hebrew is ashan. It's ein, shin. Nun, which didn't mean much to me, except as I began to explore it, I found out it was an acronym. That the Ein represents Olam, which represents space. That the, shana, uh, the uh, Shin represents the word Shana, which represents time. And that the Nun at the end represents Nefesh. So the smoke was to cover up time, space, and the soul that was there. Because according to Leviticus chapter 16, only the high priest is to go in there, but the hint is that even he was not allowed in there. In other words, he had to so nullify himself before entering into the room that though he were there physically, spiritually, he was not there. And so it was a very strange situation. So the smoke fills this room. The bulls are sacrificed on the outside. So is the ram. But then, time out while I admit, but then. I can, just for future, Steve, so you don't have to watch that. I came in as co-host so I can watch to let people in for you. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. So anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. So anyway, the, the point of this story is that as we're going along, the cataract obviously had a function. The, the smoke had a purpose and a function. But what I began to question was the sacrificing. And by that I mean to understand, first off, what, whatever happens to the smoke, how does the smoke dissipate? Rabbi Sutton had told me, and I had heard from other sources, that the smoke attaches to the walls and to the roof. And by that, they meant that we connect what's going on here with what will happen next, five days later. You see the smoke, once Yom Kippur is done, many of the rabbis, many of the Jews in Israel begin building their sukkah because five days from now will be Sukkot. And so they begin immediately to put up the walls, the smoke. And they begin to put the top on. Them. And by putting the top on, it, the, the word, the Hebrew word there is shahach. Shahach. Well, shahach doesn't mean much until I found out that they're talking about that's just the open roof line. And that that shahach happens to have the same value as 100 which triggered me back to the book, to Rosh Hashanah, because on Rosh Hashanah, one blows the so far 100 times. And so Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and Sukkot are all tied together. That's not one separate or two separate or three separate. They're all together. There is a going on. There's an improvement. There's something that's happening in this whole process. Well, Turn with me to, to 16.5. This is where I'm at. Aaron shall bring near his own sin offering, a bowl, and provide atonement for himself and for his household. He shall take two he goats and stand them before Hashem at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall place 
lots upon the two goats, one lot for Hashem and one lot for Azazel. Aaron shall bring near the he goat designated for the lot for Hashem and make it a sin offering. And the he goat designated for the Azazel, he shall he stood aside, shall be stood alive before him to provide atonement through it, to send it to Azel to the wilderness. Azel has always been, in my Christian understanding, was another name for the demon or a devil. That's not what it means. Azel is a cliff. When I was in Israel with uh, Larry and, and Tony and Glenda and a few others, David uh, Abraham uh, took us to different places. And one of the places he took us to, which he didn't say what it was at that point in time, but later he said, this is Azazel. This is the place where they took the lamb, the second lamb and they threw it over the cliff. So I began to look out and from there you can see, well, to your left would have been Jericho. Behind you would have been Jerusalem. And over to your right would have been Qumran in that whole area, in the area of the Cave of the Column, where Vendel and Larry still think that the ta tabernacle still sits. And so I was standing there, and you just look at this magnificent view of the Dead Sea. And across the Dead Sea, you see the Valley of Passengers that speaks of in 38, 37, or 38 and 39. All of this history comes blowing through your mind. But then you look around, and you see how desolate it is. And in order for us to get there, we took a four-wheel ranger. So you can imagine when the time comes, the, the high priest, remember, had two lambs standing by his side, one on his right, one on his left. Then he drew from the, a box that was brought before him two stones that were called lots. These lots were drawn out. Can you think of another holiday that does something with lots? Purim, Purim, another name for Yom Kippur is Yom Kippurim, Yom Kippurim, the lots. So the significance of this goat or these lambs, whatever you want to use for a term, is very, very significant. So they draw two lots out. He opens his hands, and in his left hand, whatever it says, that goes for there. So I'm just going to open it up, and I'm going to say, this is to Hashem. And the other one on the right hand, I'm going to say, this is the, to Azazel. So the one on the left becomes the sacrifice. And the one on the right goes out into the desert, into the wilderness, which now again puzzles me. If it's supposed to be a sacrifice, why isn't it? Why is it just simply let out into the areas outside? Well, Ibn Ezra had a understanding that the goat that is banished is not to be a sacrifice. And then he goes into an explanation, which most people have no understanding of. It took um, Nachmanides, the Ramban, to actually decode his, his understanding. Well, it begins by saying that there is a that the scapegoat, which we today, we have our own scapegoats, the scapegoat itself was not about what we had always thought it was, or at least I had thought it was. You see, it helps the people in the nation to cleanse themselves. But then the question is, how does a goat that gets sent out into the desert help somebody cleanse themselves? How can an ignorant goat be sent into the desert to die and not thought of as a lucky charm, not thought of as an idol. If you go over to page, over to page, if you go over to chapter 17, and you're looking at chapter 17, and you look at the uh, verse 7, okay? They shall no longer slaughter their offerings to the demons after whom they stray. This shall be an eternal decree to them for their generations. The word for demons here 
is the word sart. Sart is, is the same word, different pronunciation, same exact letters as the word for goat. So I read this now, they shall no longer slaughter their own offerings to the goat. Well, that makes less sense to me. Now I have to figure out what is what is the goat and the demon have in common? What am I actually looking at or what am I actually thinking about? So as I begin to look at this, I, I begin to notice something else. This goat is a gift from God, as they as Ezra will explain. This goat is a gift from God. The minister or two. God is giving it to the minister who rules over places of destruction. So God is giving a gift to what we would call demonic forces, I guess, is the easiest way to put it. And the answer is no, he's not. What's happening is this is a process. This is done in a manner to show that they were not serving forces of evil, but doing God's will. And they use the expression, like a king who gives a prize to his servant, God rewards the powers of evil for giving mankind the opportunity to overcome this power. You see, God created the power that he gave to evil forces. And so God, in some sense, is rewarding that power. But his reward is is to show us something else that's entirely different. And this is where I've been struggling for so long. I couldn't figure out what was going on. So anyway, the, the, from the Torah, looking at it, it's hard to swallow at first, but then I began to understand what it means by bribing evil forces, and especially on the holiest day of the year. Now, the Bel Shem Tov wrote this. There is no righteous man on earth who does, not, who does good and does not sin. This means that the good that he does is never clear of self-interest or sin. For when he does good without any evil, the evil inclination provokes him. So not, not so when the evil inclination sees that there is some evil interest in the deed. He leaves him and he walks away. You and I do things for other people, do mitzvahs. But in essence, what he is saying is in our, in our actions, we have this gratification afterwards where it's not totally for God. In other words, we accept some of the praise out of this event. And it's all, remember, God. God is the, is the doer. We're the receiver. When we attempt to serve and give to do, at that same point in time as we do it, oftentimes we get something out of it. And so when they send the goat out into the wilderness, the idea is that he's talking about our confessions. What is it that we're trying to do? Now, we tend to ignore evil, or we choose to ignore evil. Well, in essence, we can't, because eventually we all come back to the understanding that, you know, evil is upon us. We can't get away from it. Watching television and the news is nothing more than watching evil in action in many cases. Watching what happens to people being hurt, all of those things. But then we do something that is good and that is positive. Well, the act that we're doing is an act of submission, being lowly, right? That is our intention by doing it. But in that, there's still a piece of evil because we receive, we see, we receive a feeling, an understanding, whatever you want to call it. It's man's nature to receive. That's our ulter, ulter, ulterior motive to receive something. On the other hand, what does God do? But God is the, is the giver in all of this. 
So even when we do that, which is good, the Jew would indicate in his prayers now, since there is no tabernacle, since there is no temple, what is he doing? Well, that whole day is spent fasting and praying and singing. In his prayers, he obviously asks forgiveness for the sins that he's committed. But among those sins, he has to also ask for forgiveness for that feeling that he received the ulterior motive for doing his good. In other words, if his good was not intentionally done simply for good, then he's received something to which that is not part of a mitzvah. And so he goes through this process. In Kodeshim, it says, be holy since I, God, am holy. Now, Rashi would add to that, one might ask if I will be like God. Therefore, it says, I am God, that my holiness is above your holiness. This means that only the creator cannot have the desire to receive for himself. Only him. We all have that tendency or that reception. Now, practically speaking, the Bel Shem Tov advised his disciples to enjoy the fact that they were gaining they were gaining something during a mitzvah. But only once they had confessed that their habits are not for the sake of heaven, should they attempt to do it for heaven's sake. In other words, before you do the act, one must pray, Father, it is not for me that I do such, but it is for you. In other words, taking the idea out of and putting it back into God. Now, for example, I'm having trouble sleeping at night. So oftentimes I will get up and I will go and read, study, which is why I've got this lesson done early. But in that process, I have to know that I am going to fight against a force that is going to come against me. Because obviously, my inner does not want to serve God. It's a, my opposition. We would call it Satan. Satan is another word for adversary. So my adversary is my evil inclination. So when I get up to study, I have to think about, I think I will make some coffee. Now, when I make some coffee, of course, I have to have a couple of cookies with it. So but once I make my coffee then I can find myself relaxed. And the focus isn't on the study. The focus is on the coffee. And so when I sit down to study, I don't have that inclination to quit. And so I begin to go through the process of, of studying. So the idea is, is the fact that in some ways, I rewarded my evil inclination by getting a cup of coffee. I changed the subject. I moved it away from. And in doing so, I gained and the evil inclination appeared to gain something. Now, the idea is the fact that this goat is somewhat a bribe, a bribe to the Sitra Akra. The Sitra Akra is the other side. It's the, it's the idea of the evil inclination. It's the idea of the side of impurity, whatever word you want to use for it. And this dwells within us all the time. And in doing this, well, even as a Jew approaches God to purify themselves, they atone for their sins through their prayers. And their prayers have to include not only just a reflection of this day, but of the year. Culminate yourself. What all have you done? What has gotten in your way? Now, you can't remember specifically every single thing that you did wrong, nor can you remember every single good thing that you did. But at the same point in time, you bring what you can and what you know to God in that particular moment. Rabbi Ginsburg tells me that evil floods our consciousness from the abysses of our soul. So we must turn to the bold-faced satyr, the goat, and say, yes, you exist. 
your kicking and headbutting are very noticeable, but you have no place in me and no place with me. Go to the desert. Go to Azazel. Go out into the wilderness. And at that point, it's going to its natural habitat, the places of desolation. And at the same time, by the end of the day, the Jew comes away understanding that he has been atoned. Everything has been cared for. And he moves on at that point. But he doesn't just move on. He constructs. He begins the process of putting together the next structure. And he begins to focus on that structure, which is the sukkah, which again, that top that's over the sukkah, it's, it's branches, it's open. But in the fact that it's open, it also speaks to the wing of the Shekinah, because you see, that's what finishes the cover. Those branches are like feathers over the top. And you cover this sukkah that you built that is there for the purpose of, for the next few days, life, study, doing what you can inside the sukkah. Now, in the Mishnah, after at Yom Kippur, after the sacrifice is made of the, of the lamb, and the, the high priest has gone into the Holy of Holies with the ashes and with the cup of, of Kedaret. The goat, the second goat, has already gone out. But during that time, it is taught that there was a red rope, ribbon, sash, whatever word you want to use, attached to the, to the doorway, to the temple, or to the curtain. And at the point in time in which all of this was going on, and the priest was now praying for the sins of the nation, at that point in time, that which was red turns white, which goes back to Isaiah, where it says, uh, what is it that say? Um, oh, yeah, if your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's Exodus, or Isaiah chapter 1. In orthodoxy, Jews today take, an, take the attitude of confession of all their sins and exposing all their evil. Then they end their day by banishing it from the face of the earth. That's what happens at the end of the day. So they've gone through an entire process of cleansing themselves, or more concisely, of getting rid of the no good evil inclination. And they start over again the next day. But I've already begun the process that evening, after the day is done, because that evening begins the next day. That's when they begin the process of assembling their sukkah. So, I just disappeared. Oh, there I am. I don't know what I did, but I just disappeared. That's what I understand today that I didn't understand before. What this goat was, the fact that it wasn't, the goat wasn't a demon, although it was there as a bribe. 